Hello everyone, and welcome to Word of Mouth. For those of you who do not know, Word of Mouth is an adult story time presented by the Juliet Hampton Morgan Memorial Library. My name is Andrew, and today I'll be reading two stories for you. We're going to be reading Wildfire in Manhattan by Joanne Harris and October to Dale by Neil Gaiman. If you enjoyed today's readings and would like to watch the next program, uh, Word of Mouth broadcasts on the first and third Thursdays of each month. So our next broadcast would be on July 16th, that's two weeks from today, at 12.10 p.m. Central Time. You can watch it live through the Morgan Memorial Library's Facebook page, that's at MCCPL Morgan, or on the YouTube page for the Montgomery City County Public Library System. I think that's all the introduction I've got for today, so let's get started. Our first tale is Wildfire in Manhattan by Joanne Harris. <clears throat> it's not my name, well, not quite, but you can call me Lucky. I live right here in Manhattan in the penthouse suite of a hotel just off Central Park. I'm a model citizen in every way, polite, punctual, and orderly. I wear sharp suits, I wax my chest hair. You'd never think I was a god. It's a truth often overlooked that old gods, like old dogs, have to die sometime. It just takes longer, that's all. And in the meantime, citadels may fall, empires collapse, worlds end, and folk like us end up on the pile, redundant and largely forgotten. In many ways, I've been fortunate. My element is fire, which never quite goes out of style. There are aspects of me that still wield power. There's too much of the primitive left in you folk for it to be otherwise. And although I don't get as many sacrifices as I used to, I can still get obeisance if I want it. And who doesn't? After dark, when the campfires are lit, and the dry lightning strikes across the plains, yes, they're mine, and the forest fires, and the funeral pyres, and the random sparks, and the human torches, all mine. But here in New York, I'm Lucas Wilde, lead singer in the rock band Wildfire. Well, I say band. Our only album, Burn It Up, went platinum when the drummer was tragically killed on stage by a freakish blast of lightning. Well, maybe not so freakish. Our only U.S. tour was stopped by lightning from beginning to end. Of 50 venues, 31 suffered a direct hit. In just nine weeks, we lost three more drummers, six roadies, and a truckload of gear. Even I was beginning to think I'd taken it just a little too far. Still, it was a great show. Nowadays, I'm semi-retired. I can afford to be as one of only two surviving members. I have a nice little income, and when I'm feeling bored, I play piano in a fetish bar called the Red Room. I'm not into rubber myself, it's too sweaty, but you can't deny that it makes a terrific insulator. And now you may have gathered, I'm a night person. Daylight rather cramps my style, and besides, fire needs a night sky to show to best advantage. An evening in the Red Room, playing piano and eyeing the girls, then downtown for the rest of recreation. Not a scene my brother frequents. And so it was with some surprise that I ran smack into him that night as I was checking out the nicely flammable back streets of the Upper East Side, humming light my fire and contemplating a spot of arson. I didn't say. Yes, in this present aspect, I do have a brother, Brendan, a twin. We're not close. Wildfire and Hearthfire don't have a lot in common, and he rather disapproves of my flamboyant lifestyle, preferring the more domestic joys of baking and grilling. Imagine that, a fire god running a restaurant. It makes me burn with shame. Still, it's his funeral. Each of us goes to hell in his own way. And besides, his flame-grilled steaks are the best in the business. It was past midnight, and I was a little lightheaded from the booze, but not so drunk that you'd have noticed, and the streets were as still as they get in a city that only ever shuts one eye. A huddle of washouts sleeping in cardboard boxes under a fire escape, a cat raiding a dumpster. It was November, steam plumed from the sewer grates, and sidewalks were shiny with cold sweat. I was just crossing the intersection of 81st and 5th, in front of the Hungarian meat market when I saw him. A familiar figure with hair the color of embers tucked into a coat. Tall, slim, and ballet quick, you might almost have been forgiven for thinking it was me. 
Close scrutiny, however, reveals the truth. My eyes are red and green. His, on the other hand, are green and red. I wouldn't be seen dead anyways wearing those shoes. I greeted him cheerily. Do I smell burning? He turned to me with a hunted expression. Shh. Listen. I was curious. I know there's never been much love between us, but he usually greets me, at least, before he starts with the recriminations. He called me by my true name, put a finger to his lips, then dragged me into a side alley that stank of piss. Hey, Brent, what gives? I whispered, correcting my lapels. His only reply was a curt nod in the direction of the near-deserted alley. In the shadows, two men, boxy in their long overcoats, hats pulled down over narrow, identical faces. They stopped for a second on the curb, checked left, checked right, and crossed over with swift, effortless choreography before vanishing wolfish into the night. I see, and I did. I'd seen them before. I could feel it in my blood. And believe me, they were men in form alone. Beneath those cartoon detective overcoats, they were all teeth. What do you think they're doing here? He shrugged. Hunting? Hunting who? He shrugged again. He's never been a man of many words, even when he wasn't a man. Me? I'm on the wordy side. I find it helps. So you've seen them here before? I was following them when you came along. I doubled back. I didn't want to leave them home. Well, I could understand that. What are they, I said. Aspects of what? I haven't seen anything like this since Ragnarok, but as I recall, shh. I was getting kind of sick of being shoved and shushed. He's the elder twin, and sometimes he does take liberties. I was about to give him a heated reply when I heard a sound coming from nearby, and something swam into rapid view. It took me a while to figure it out. Derelicts are hard to see in this city, and he's been hiding in a cardboard box under the fire escape. But now he'd shifted quickly enough, his old overcoat flapping like wings around his bony ankles. I knew him in passing. Old Man Mooney, here as an aspect of Monty the Moon. But Matt is an old coot, poor old sod. It often happens like that when they've been out of juice, and the meat of poetry is a heady brew. Still, he could run, and he was running now. But, as Bryn and I stepped out of his way, the two guys in their long overcoats came to intercept him at the mouth of the alley. Closer this time, I could smell them, a rank and feral smell half rotted. Well, you know what they say, you can't teach a carnivore oral hygiene. At my side, I could feel my brother trembling. Or was it me? I wasn't sure. I was scared, I knew that, but... There was still enough alcohol cruising in my veins for it to make me feel slightly removed from it all. And in any case, I stayed put, tucked into the shadows, not quite daring to move. The two guys stood there at the mouth of the alley, and Mooney stopped, wavering now between fight and flight. And fight it was, okay, I thought. Even a rat will run when cornered. That didn't mean I had to get involved. I could smell him, too, the underpining stench of him, of booze and dirt and that stinky, sickly poet smell. He was scared, I knew that, but he was also a god, be it a beat-up aspect of one, and that meant he'd fight like a god, and even an old, alky god like Mooney has his tricks. Those two guys might yet have a shot coming. For a moment they held their position, two overcoats and a mad poet in a dark triangle under a single street light. Then they moved, the guys with their slick, fluid motion I'd seen before. Mooney with a lurch and a yell and a flash from his fingertips. He'd cast here a powerful rune, and I saw a flicker through the darkness like a shard of steel, hurtling towards the new not-quite-men. They dodged, no pas de deux could have done more grace, parting then coming together again as the missile passed, moving in a tight axe-head formation towards the old god. But 
throwing tear had thrown moon. It takes strength to cast the runes of the Elder Script, and most of his glam was already gone. He opened his mouth to speak a cantrip, I thought, but before he could, the overcoats moved in with that spooky, superhuman speed, and I could smell their rankness once more, but so much stronger, like the inside of a badger's scent. They closed in, unbuttoning their coats as they ran, but were they running? Instead, they seemed to glide like boats, unfurling their long coats like sails to hide and envelop the beleaguered moon god. He began to chant with me to poetry, you know, but for a second the drunken voice cracked and changed, becoming that of Manny in his full aspect. A sudden radiance shone forth, and predators gave a single growl, baring their teeth, and for a moment I heard the chariot chant of the mad moon god in a language you could never learn, but of which a single word could drive a mortal crazy with rapture, bring down the stars, strike a man dead, or raise him back to life again. He chanted in four beat, the hunters paused, and was that a single trace of a tear gleaming in the shadow of the black fedora? And many sang a glamour of love and death, and of the beauty that is desolation, and of the brief firefly that lights up the darkness. For wings beat, for breath, for it gutters, burns, and dies. But the chant did not halt them for more than a second. Tears or not, these guys were hungry. They glided forward, hands outstretched, and now I could see it inside their unbuttoned coats. And for a moment I was sure that there was no body beneath their clothes. No fur or scale, no flesh or bone. There was just the shadow. The blackness of chaos, a blackness beyond color or even its absence. A hole in the world, all devouring, all hungry. Brendan took a single step and I caught him by the arm and held him back. It was too late anyways. Old Mooney was already done for. He went down, not with a crash, but with an eerie sigh, as if he'd been punctured. And the creatures that now no longer even looked like men were on him like hyenas. Things gleaming, static hissing in the folds of their garments. There was nothing human in the way they moved. Nothing superfluous. They hoovered him up from blood to brain. Every glamour, every spark, every piece of kith and kindling. And what they left looked like less in the man than a cardboard cutout of a man. Left lying there in the dirt of the alleyway. Then... They were gone, buttoning up their overcoats over the terrible absence beneath. A silence. Brendan was crying. He always was a sensitive one. I wiped something, sweat I think, from my face and waited for my breathing to return to normal. That was nasty, I said at last. Haven't seen anything quite like that since the end of the world. Did you hear him? said Brendan. I heard. Who would have thought that the old man had so much glam in him? My brother said nothing but hid his eyes. I suddenly realized I was hungry and thought for a moment of suggesting a pizza, but decided against it. Bren was so touchy nowadays he might have taken offense. Well, I'll see you later, I guess and slipped off rather unsteadily, wondering why brothers are always so damned hard, and wishing I'd been able to ask him home. I wasn't to know, but I wish I had, that I'd never see that aspect of him again. I slept till late the next day, awoke with a headache and a familiar post-cocktail nauseous feeling. Then I remembered. The way you remember doing something to your back when you were at the gym, but didn't realize how bad it was going to be until you'd slept on it and sat bolt upright. Those guys, I thought, those two guys. I must have been drunker than I'd thought last night because this morning the memory of them froze me to the core. Delayed shock, I know it well, and to combat its effects, I called room service and ordered the works. Over coffee, bacon, pancakes, and rivers of maple syrup, I worked on my recovery and Though I did pretty well given the circumstances, I found that I couldn't quite get the death of Old Mooney out of my mind, 
O'er the slick way the two overcoats had crawled over him, gobbling up his glam, before buttoning up and back to business. Poetry in motion. I pondered my lucky escape. Well, I guess that if they hadn't sniffed out Mooney first, then it would have been yours truly, and Brother Bren, for a devil serving of dish of the day. But my heart was far from light as it occurred to me that if these guys were really after our kind, this was at best a reprieve, not a pardon. And that sooner or later those overcoats would be sharpening their teeth at my door. So I finished breakfast and called Bren, but all I got was his answering machine. And so I looked up the number of his restaurant and dialed it. The line was dead. I would have tried his mobile, but like I said, we're not close. So I didn't know it, or the name of his girl, or even the number of his house. Too late now, right? Just goes to show, carpe diem and all that. And so I showered and dressed and put off in haste, wandering gathering clouds to the flying pizza, Bren's place of work. What a dumb name. In the hopes of getting some sense out of my twin. It was there that I realized that something was amiss. Ten blocks away, I knew it already, and the sirens and the engines and the shouting and the smoke were all just confirmation. There was something ominous about those gathering thunderclouds, and the way they sat like a Russian hat, all spiky with needles of lightning above the scene of devastation. My heart sank lower the closer I got. Something was amiss, all right. Looking around to ensure that I was unobserved, I cast the visionary room Bjarken in my hand and squinted through its spyglass shape. Smoke, I saw, and lightning from the ground, my brother's face looking pale and strained. Then fire, darkness, then, as I'd feared, the shadow, and its minions the wolves, the shadow hunters boxed in their heavy overcoats. Those guys I thought and cursed. Again? And now I knew where I'd known them before. And they were pretty bad in that aspect too, though. I had more on my plate at the time than I do nowadays, and I'll admit I didn't give them my full attention. I did now, though, casting runes of concealment about me as I skirted the funnel of black smoke. The funeral pyre of my brother's restaurant. And for all I knew of Brendan himself, who had looked pretty wasted in my vision. I got there at last, keeping an eye out for overcoats to find fire engines and cop cars everywhere. A line had been cordoned off at the end of the road, and there were men trying to spray water over the great fizzing spume of flame that had already dug its roots deep into the flying pizza. I could have told them that they were wasting their time. You can't put out the work of a fire god even a god of hearth fire like it was just a squib. The flames sheeted up, thirty, forty, fifty feet high, clean and yellow, and shot through with glamours that probably would have looked like dancing sparks to your kind, but which, if they touched you, would have stripped you flesh to bone in one. And Brendan, I thought, could he be alive somewhere? Well, if he was, he must have run. There was no way anyone could have survived the blaze. It wasn't like Bren to flee the scene. He had turned and fought. I'd seen this much in my vision, and my brother was so dead set against the use of glamours among the folk that he wouldn't have used them if he'd had any kind of choice. I used oaths and rune of mystery to scry my brother's fate. I saw their faces, thin and wolfish, saw his smile teeth bared so that for a second in my vision, could have been me, wild and furious and filled with killing rage. He could be okay, my brother, you know. He just took more time to fire up. I saw him drawing his mind sword, flaming it was with an edge that shivered translucent light, a sword that could have cut through granite or silk with the same easy slice. A sword I hadn't seen since the last time the world ended. A flickering flame of a fire god's sword that just touched the shadow inside the unbuttoned overcoat and went out like a puff of smoke. Then, in the dark, they were all over him. Weston answered, well, at least my brother went out in style.
I wiped my face and pondered the points. Point one, I was now an only twin. Point two, unless he'd taken his assailants with him, which I doubted, by now the two coats would be on my trail. Point three, I was just embarking on point three when a heavy hand fell on my shoulder. Another grasped my arm just above the elbow, and then both applied a painful pressure, which soon became excruciating as a joint locked and a low, familiar voice rasped in my ear. Lucky, I should have known you were in this somehow. The shambles has got your mark all over it. I yelped and tried to free my arm, but the other bastard was holding it too tight. Move, and I'll break it, snarled the voice. Now, perhaps I ought to break it anyways, just for old time's sake. I indicated to him that I'd rather he didn't. He locked my arm a little further, and I felt it begin to go and screamed. Then he shoved me hard towards the alley wall. I hit it, bounced, spun around with my sword ready, half drawn, and found myself staring into a pair of eyes as grim and colorless as a rainy day. Just my luck, a friend with an old grievance, which is the only kind I tend to have nowadays. Well, I say friend. He's one of our kind, but you know how it is. Fire and rainstorm, we don't get along. Besides, in his present aspect, he stood taller, weighed heavier, and hit harder than me. His face was a thundercloud, and any thought I had of fighting the guy evaporated like cheap perfume. I sheathed the sword and took the better part of valor. Hey, I said, it's our Thor. He sniffed. Try anything and I'll douse you cold. He said, I've got an army of storm clouds ready to roll. You'll be out like a light before you can blink. Want to try it? Did I ever? Nice greeting, friend. It's been a long time. He grunted. Arthur's name in this present aspect. Arthur Pluvio. And you're dead. He made it sound like some weird kind of naming ceremony. Wrong, I said, Brendanstead. And if you think I'd be party to the murder of my own brother... Wouldn't put it past you, Arthur said, though I could tell the news had shaken him. Brendan's dead, he repeated. Afraid so. I was touched. I'd always thought he hated us both. Then this wasn't you. My, you're fast. He glowered. Then, how? How else, I shrugged. The shadow, of course. Chaos, black, cert, choose your own damned metaphor. Arthur gave a long, soft sigh, as if it had preyed on his mind for such a long time that any news, even bad news, even terrible news, could come as relief. So it's true, he said. I was beginning to think. Finally. He ignored the jibe and turned on me once more, his rainy day eyes gleaming. It's the wolves, Lucky. The wolves are on the trail again. I nodded. Wolves, demons. No word exists in any tongue of the folk to describe exactly what they were. I call them ephemera. Though I had to admit there was nothing ephemeral about their current aspect. Skull and Haiti, the Sky Hunters, servants of the shadow, devourers of the sun and moon, and of anything else that happens to be in their way, for that matter. Brendan must have tried to tackle them. He never did have any sense. But I could tell he was no longer listening. The sun and moon. I gave him the abridged version on the events of last night. He listened, but I could tell he was distracted. So, after the moon, the sun, right? I guess, I shrugged. That is, assuming there's an aspect of soul in Manhattan, which, if there is, there is, said Arthur grimly. Her name's Sun. And there was something about his eyes as he said it something even more ominous than the rain that swelled clouds above us, or his hand on my shoulder, horribly pally and heavy as lead, 
that made me think I was in for an even lousier day than I've had so far. Sunny, I said, then she'll be next. Over my dead body, said Arthur, and yours, he added, almost as an afterthought, keeping his hand hard on my shoulder and smiling that dangerous, stormy smile. Sure, why not? I humored him. I could afford to. I'm used to running, and I knew that in a pitch, Lucas Wilde could disappear within an hour, leaving no trace. He knew it too. His eyes narrowed, and above us the clouds began to move softly, gathering momentum like wool on a spindle. A dimple appeared at its nadir, soon I knew, to become a funnel of air, stitched and barbed with deadly glamours. Remember what they say, said Arthur, addressing me by my true name. Everywhere you go, you always take the weather with you. You wronged me, I smiled, though I never felt less like it. I'll be only too happy to help your friend. Good, said Arthur. He kept that hand on my shoulder, though, and his smile was all teeth. We'll keep to the shadows. No need to involve the folk any more than we have to. Right? It was a dark and stormy afternoon. I had an idea that it was going to be the first of many. Sonny lived in Brooklyn Heights in a loft apartment on a quiet street. Not a place I visit often, which accounts for my not having spotted her sooner. Most of our kind take the discreet approach. Gods have enemies too, you know and we find it pays to keep our glam to ourselves. But Sunny was different. For a start, according to Arthur, what a dumb name, she didn't know that she was anymore. It happens sometimes, you just forget. You get all wrapped up in your current aspect. You start to think you're like everyone else. Perhaps that's what kept her safe for so long. They say gods look after drunks and half-wits and little children. And Sonny certainly qualified. Transpires that my old pal Arthur had been looking after her for nearly a year without her knowing it, making sure that she got the sunshine she needed to be happy, keeping sniffers and prowlers away from the door. Because even the folk start to get suspicious when someone like Sonny lives nearby. It wasn't just the fact that it hadn't rained in months, that sometimes all of New York City could be under a cloud, but for the two or three streets surrounding her block, or the funny northern lights that sometimes shone in the sky above her apartment, it was her, just her, with that face and her smile, turning heads wherever she went. A man, even a god, could fall in love. Arthur had dropped his rain god aspect and was looking more or less like a regular citizen. I could tell he was making a hell of an effort. And as soon as we crossed the Brooklyn Bridge, I could see him beginning to hold it in, the way a fat man holds in his gut when a pretty girl comes into the room. Then I saw her colors from afar, like lights in the sky, and the look on his face, the look of translucent yearning intensified just a little. He gave me a critical once-over. Tone it down a bit, will ya? He said. Well, that was offensive. I'd looked a lot flashier as Lucas Wilde, but looking at Arthur right then, I thought it a bad time to say so. I turned down the volume on my red coat, but kept my hair as it was, hiding my mismatched eyes behind a pair of snappy shades. Better? You'll do? We were standing outside the place now, a standard apartment at the back of a lot of others. Black fire escape, small windows, little roof garden throwing down wisps of greenery into the guttering. But at the window there was a light, something rather like sunlight, I guess, occasionally strobing here and there, following her movements as she wandered around her flat. Some people have no idea how to go unnoticed. In fact, it was astonishing that the wolves hadn't seized on her before. She'd not even tried to hide her colors, which, frankly, was beyond unwise. I thought, hell, she hadn't even pulled the drapes. Arthur gave me one of his looks. 
We are going to protect her, Larkin, he said. And you're going to be nice. Okay? I made a face. I am always nice. How could you possibly doubt me? She invited us in straight away. No checking of credentials, no suspicious glance from behind the open drapes. I had her down as pretty but dumb. Now, I saw she was a genuine innocent. A little girl lost in the big city. Not my type, naturally, but I could see what Arthur saw in her. She offered us a cup of ginseng tea. Any friend of Arthur's, she said. I saw his painful grimace as he tried to fit his big fingers around the little china cup, all the while trying to hold himself in so that Sonny could have her sunshine. Finally, it was too much for him. He let out with a gasp of release, and the rain started to come down in snakes, hissing into the gutters. Sonny looked dismayed. Damn rain! Arthur looked like someone had punched him hard right in the place where thunder gods keep their ego. He gave that feeble smile again. It doesn't make you feel safe, he said. You don't think there's a kind of poetry in the sound, like little hammers beating down onto the rooftops? Sonny shook her head. Yuck. I lit the fire with a discreet cantrip and the fingering of the rune can. Little flames shot out of the grate and danced winsomely across the hearth. It was a good trick, though I say it myself, especially as it was an electric fire. Neat, said Sonny, smiling again. Arthur gave a low growl. So, have you seen anything strange around here lately? Stupid damn question, I told myself. Move a sun goddess onto the third floor of a Manhattan brownstone, and you're apt to see more than occasional pyrotechnics. No um, guys in suits, I went on. Dark overcoats and fedora hats. Like someone uh, from a bad 50s comic strip. Oh, those guys? Sunny poured more tea. Yeah, I saw them yesterday. They were sniffing around in the alleyway. Sunny's blue eyes darkened a little. They didn't look friendly. What do they want? I was going to tell her about Bryn and what had happened to old man Mooney. But Arthur stopped me with a glance. Sonny has that effect, you know. Makes guys want to do stupid things. Stupid, noble, self-sacrificing things. And I was beginning to understand that I was going to be a part of it whether I wanted to or not. Nothing you need to worry about, Arthur said with a big smile, clamping a hand on my upper arm and marching me out onto the alleyway. They're just some guys we're looking for. We'll camp out here tonight and keep an eye on them for you. Any trouble, we'll be here. No need for you to worry, okay? Okay, said Sonny. Okay, I said between gritted teeth. My arm felt like it had been pounded several times with a hammer. I waited until we were alone and Sonny had drawn the curtains. Then I turned on him. What's the deal, I said. We can't hold back the Shadow Wolves. You must know that by now, right? You saw what they did to Mooney and Bren. Our only chance is to outrun them, to take your lady friend with you and run like the blazes to another city, to another continent if we can, where the shadow has less influence. Arthur looked stubborn. I won't run. Fine. Well, it's been a blow by arm. And neither will you, said Arthur. Well, if you put it that way, I may be a trifle impetuous, but I know when to surrender to force majeure. Arthur had his mind set on both of us being heroes. My only remaining choice was whether to set my mind to helping him, thereby possibly saving both our hives, or to make a run for it as soon as the bastard's guard was down. Well, I might have gone down either path, but just then I caught sight of our boys in the alleyway sniffing and snarling like wolves in suits, and I was down to no choice at all. I drew my mind sword, he drew his. Glamours and runes distressed the night air. Not that they would help us, I thought, and helped my brother Bren, or the mad old moon god, and shadow, or chaos if you prefer, 
had plenty of glamours of its own with which to strike down three renegade gods, fugitives left over from the end of the world. Hey, up here, yelled Arthur. Two pairs of eyes turned towards us, a hiss like static as the ephemera turned into our whereabouts. A glint of teeth as they grinned, and then they were crawling up the fire escape. All pretense of humanity was gone. Slick beneath those boxy black overcoats. Nothing much in there but tooth and claw. Like poetry with an appetite. Oh, great, I thought. Way to keep a low profile, R. Thor. Was it an act of self-sacrifice? A ploy to attract attention? Or could he possibly have a plan? If he did, then it would be a first. Mindless self-sacrifice was about his level. I wouldn't have minded it that much, but it was clear to me that in his boundless generosity, he also meant to sacrifice me. Lucky, it was raining again. Great ropes and coils of thunderous rain thrashed down onto our bowed heads, all gleaming in the neon lights and shades of black and orange. From a static-ridden sky, great flakes of snow lumbered down. Well, that's what happens around a thunder god under stress, but it didn't stop me getting soaked and wishing that I'd brought an umbrella. It didn't stop the ephemera, though. Even the bolts of lightning that crashed like stray missiles into the alleyway. I had skills, too, and I was using them like the blazes by then. Had no effect on the wolves of chaos, whose immensely slick and somehow snake-like forms were now poised on the fire escape beneath us, ten feet away ready to pounce. One did, a mind bolt flew, and I recognized the rune Hagal, one of my colleagues most powerful, and yet it passed through the ephemera with a squeal of awesome feedback, and the creature was on us again, unbuttoning its overcoat, and now I was sure that there were stars in there, stars and the mindless static of space. Look, I said, what do you want? Girls? Money? Power? Thing, I can get you all those things, no problem. I've got influence in this world. Two handsome single guys like yourselves? Hey, you could make a killing in showbiz. Perhaps not the wisest choice of words. The full first wolf leered. Killing, it said. By then I could smell it again, and I knew that words couldn't save me. First, the thing was ravenous. Second, nothing with that level of halitosis could possibly hope to make it in the music business. Some guys I knew had come pretty close. My daughter Hell, for instance, has, in spite of her, shall we say, alternative looks, made quite a serious fan base in certain circles. But, not these guys, I mean. Ew. I flung a handful of mind runes then. Tear, can, Hagal, ear, but none of them even slowed it down. The other wolf was onto us now, and Arthur was wrestling with it, caught in the flaps of its black overcoat. The balcony was pulling away from the wall. Sparks and shards of rune light hissed into the torrential rain. Damn it, I thought, I'm going to die wet. And I flung up a shield using the rune soul. And with the last desperate surge of my glam, I cast all of the fire runes of the first a tear at the two creatures that once had been wolves, but now were grim incarnations of revenge. Because nothing escapes from chaos. Not thunder, not wildfire, not even the sun. You guys okay out there? It was sunny, peering through the gap in the curtains. Do you want more ginseng tea? Ah, uh, no thanks, said Arthur, now with a demon wolf in each hand and that stupid grin on his face again. Look, uh, Sonny, go inside. I'm kind of busy right now. The thing that Arthur had been holding at bay finally escaped his grasp. It didn't go far, though. It sprang at me and knocked me backwards against the rail. The balcony gave way with a screech, and we all fell together, three floors down. I hit the deck damned hard, with the ephemera right on top of me, and all the fight was knocked out of me, and I knew 
I was finished. Sunny peered down from her window. Do you need help? She called to me. I could see right into the creature now, and it was grim, like those fairy tales where the sisters get their toes chopped off, and all the bad guys get pecked to death by crows, and even the little mermaid has to walk on razor blades for the rest of her life for daring to fall in love. Except that I knew Sunny had got the Disney version instead, with all the happy endings in it, and the chipmunks, and the rabbits, and the goddamn squirrels. I hate squirrels singing harmony where even the wolves are good guys and no one ever really gets hurt. I gave her a sarcastic smile. Yeah, would you? I said. Okay, said Sunny, and pulled the drapes and stepped out onto the balcony. And then something very weird happened. I was watching her from the alleyway, my arms pinned to my sides now, and the ephemera straddling me with its overcoat spread like a vulture about to spear an eyeball. The cold was so intense that I couldn't feel my hands at all, and the stench of the thing made my head swim, and the rain was pounding onto my face, and my glam was bleeding out so fast that I knew I had seconds. No more. So the first thing she did was put her umbrella up. Ignoring Arthur's desperate commands? Besides, he was still wrestling with the second ephemera. His colors were flaring garishly. Moonlight whirled around them both, warring with the driving rain. And then she smiled. It was as if the sun had come out, except that it was night, and the light was like 60 times more powerful than the brightest light that you've ever known. And the alley lit up luminous white, and I screwed my eyes shut to prevent them from being burnt there and then out of their sockets. And all these things happened at once. First of all, the rain stopped, the pressure on my chest disappeared, and I could move my arms again. The light, which had been too intense even to see when it first shone out, diffused itself to a greenish-pink glow. Birds on the rooftops began to sing, a scent of something floral filled the air. Strangest of all, in that alleyway where the smell of piss was so predominant, and someone put a hand on my face and said, it's okay, sweetie. They're gone now. Well, that was it. I opened my eyes and figured that either I'd taken more concussion than I thought, or there was something that R. Thor hadn't told me. He was standing over me, looking self-conscious and bashful. Sunny was shining like the summer sky, and her bare feet were like little white birds, and her sugar blonde hair fell over my face, and I was glad she really wasn't my type because that lady was nothing but trouble. And she gave me a smile like a summer's day, and Arthur's face went dangerously red. And Sonny said, Lucky, are you okay? I rubbed my eyes. I think so. What happened to Skoll and Haytu? Those guys, she said. Oh, they had to go. I sent them back to the shadow. Now Arthur was looking incredulous. How do you know about Shadow? he said. Oh, Arthur, you're so sweet. Sonny pirouetted on his feet and planted a kiss on Arthur's nose. As if I could have lived here this long and not have known I was different. She looked at the illuminated sky. Northern lights, she said happily. We ought to have more often here, but I really do appreciate it, she went on. You guys looking out for me and everything? If things had been different, if we hadn't been made from such different elements, then maybe you and I could have, you know. Arthur's face went, if possible, even redder. So what are we going to do now? She said. I guess we're safe, for a while at least, but chaos knows about us now, and the shadow never really gives up. I thought about it for a while, and then an idea came to me. I said, have you ever thought of a career in entertainment? I could find a job for you with the band. I wondered if she could sing. Most celestial spheres can, of course. And anyways, she'd light up the place just by stepping onto the stage. You'd save a fortune in pyrotechnics. She gave that megawatt smile of hers. Is Arthur in the band too? I looked at him. He could be, I guess. There's always room for a drummer. Come to think of it, 
there's a lot to be said for going on the road right now. New people, new lineup, new places to go. That would be nice. Her face was wistful. His was like that of a sick puppy, and it made me even more relieved that I'd never been the romantic type. I tried to imagine the outcome. Sun goddess and thunder god and stage together every night. I could see it now, I thought. Wildfire on tour again. I mean, we're talking rains of fish, equatorial northern lights, hurricanes, eclipses, solar flares, flash floods, and lightning. Lots of lightning. Might be a little risky, of course, but all the same, hell of a show. October Tale by Neil Gaiman. Oh, that feels good, I said, and stretched my neck to get out the last of the cramp. It didn't just feel good, it felt great, actually. I'd been squashed up inside that lamp for so long, you start to think that nobody's ever going to rub it again. You're a genie, said the young lady with the polishing cloth in her hand. I am? You're a smart girl, toots. What gave me away? Me appearing in a puff of smoke, she said. And you look like a genie. You've got the turban and the pointy shoes. I folded my arms and blinked. Now I was wearing blue jeans, gray sneakers, and a faded gray sweater. The male uniform of this time and this place. I raised a hand to my forehead, and I bowed deeply. I am a genie of the lamp, I told her. Rejoice, O fortunate one! for I have it in my power to grant you three wishes. And don't try the I wish for more wishes thing. I won't play, and you'll lose a wish. Right? Go for it. I folded my arms again. No, she said. I mean, thanks and all that, but it's fine. I'm good. Hi, I said. Toots, sweetie, perhaps you misheard me. I am a genie, and the three wishes, we're talking anything you want. You ever dreamed of flying? I can give you wings. You want to be wealthy, richer than Croesus? You want power? Just say it. Three wishes, whatever you want. Like I said, she said, thanks, but I'm fine. Would you like something to drink? You must be parched after spending so much time in that lamp. Water, wine, tea? Uh, now that she came to mention it, I was thirsty. Do you have any mint tea? She made me some mint tea in a teapot that was almost a twin to the lamp in which I'd spent the greater part of the last thousand years. Thank you for the tea. No problem. But I don't get it. Everyone I've ever met, they start asking for things. A fancy house, a harem of gorgeous women. Not that you'd want that, of course. I might, she said can't just make assumptions about people. Oh, and don't call me Toots or Sweetie or any of those things. My name is Hazel. Ah, I understood. You want a beautiful woman, then. My apologies, you have but to wish. I folded my arms. No, she said. I'm good. No wishes. How's the tea? I told her that the mint tea was the finest that I'd ever tasted. She asked me when I had started feeling a need to grant people's wishes, and whether I felt a desperate need to please. She asked about my mother, and I told her that she could not judge me, and she would have judged mortals. For I was a djinn, powerful and wise, magical and mysterious. She asked me if I liked hummus, and when I said that I did, she toasted a pita bread and sliced it up for me to dip into the hummus. I dipped my bread slices into the hummus and ate it with delight. The hummus gave me an idea. Just make a wish, I said helpfully, and I could have a meal fit for a sultan brought in to you. Each dish would be finer than the one before it, and all served upon golden plates. And you could keep the plates afterwards. It's good, she said with a smile. Would you like to go for a walk? We walked together through the town. It felt good to stretch my legs after so many years in the land. We wound up in a public park, sitting on a bench by a lake. It was warm but gusty, and the autumn leaves fell in flurries each time the wind blew. 
I told Hazel about my youth as a gem and how we used to eavesdrop on angels and how they would throw comments at us if they spied us listening. I told her of the bad days of the gem wars and how King Suleiman had imprisoned us inside hollow objects, bottles, lamps, clay pots, that kind of thing. She told me of her parents, who were both killed in the same plane crash and who had left her the house. She told me of her job illustrating children's books, a job that she had backed into accidentally at the point that she realized she would never really be a competent medical illustrator, and of how happy she became whenever she was sent new books to illustrate. She told me she taught life drawing to adults at the local community college one evening a week. I saw no obvious flaw in her life. No hole that she could fill by wishing, save for one. Your life is good, I told her, but you have no one to share it with. Wish, and I will bring you the perfect man or woman, a film star, a rich person. No need, she said. I'm good. We walked back to her house, past houses dressed for Halloween. This is not right, I said. People always want something. Not me. I've got everything I need. Then what do I do? She thought for a moment. Then she pointed at her front yard. Can you rake the leaves? Is that your wish? No. Just something you can do while I'm getting our dinner ready. I rake the leaves into a heap by the hedge to stop the wind from blowing it apart. After dinner, I washed up the dishes, and I spent the night in Hazel's spare bedroom. It wasn't that she didn't want help. She let me help. I ran errands for her, picked up art supplies and groceries. On days she had been painting for a long time, she let me rub her back and shoulders. I have good, firm hands. Shortly before Thanksgiving, I moved out of the spare bedroom across the hall into the main bedroom in Hazel's bed. I watched her face this morning as she slept. I stared at the shapes her lips make when she sleeps. Creeping sunlight touched her face, and she opened her eyes and stared at me, and she smiled. You know what I never asked, she said, is what about you? What would you wish for if you had three wishes? I thought for a moment. I put my arm around her, and she snuggled her head into my shoulder. It's okay, I told her. I'm good. All right, that is it for our stories for this week. I hope you guys enjoyed them. Uh, we will be back, as I said earlier, in two weeks' time on the 16th of July. We'll be reading two stories then by Ray Bradbury. Those stories will be The Dragon Danced at Midnight and The Enemy in the Wheat. Hope to see you then.